I'm here today in Melbourne at the Postgraduate Medical Council of Victoria. They've kindly invited me to attend their surveyor training day. Surveys are the ways that bodies like the Postgraduate Medical Council of Victoria ensure that hospitals are good for the training and well-being of interns and other pre-vocational trainees, as well as importantly, safe for patients. The surveys will be one of the key ways that the National Intern Framework is going to be reviewed and checked over time. The PMCV were also kind enough to organise for me to talk to a couple of the key stakeholders in these changes. The Prevocational Medical Council of Victoria, the PMCV, is the body responsible for internship, or PGY1, which stands for Prevocational Graduate Year 1, and Resident Accreditation, or PGY2. Although in Victoria, residents are more commonly referred to as HMOs, which is hospital medical officers. The PMCV was kind enough to introduce me to a couple of people who have already been involved in the work and the discussions going on in Victoria to implement the new framework. Dr. Jenny Newman is the Director of Prevocational Training at St. Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne. Jenny has responsibility for the training and support of 68 interns and approximately 150 hospital medical officers in their second and third years, as well as a number of other trainee doctors. Hello, Jenny. How are you today? Good morning. Very well, thanks, Anthony. Great to have you on the interview. Monique Wisniewski is the Chair of the Medical Students Council of Victoria, which is the peak body representing more than 4,000 medical students in the state of Victoria. Monique is studying medicine at Monash Medical School and is currently in her final year. So it's the current medical students in their final year that have the keenest interest in the changes as it's those who are going to train under the new system for the first time in 2024. Thanks for joining me as well, Monique. Thank you for having me, Anthony. It's great to have you on board. So Jenny, I might put the first question to you. You work closely with not only interns and hospital medical officers, but also the registrars and the consultants who supervise these doctors. Could you sum up how everyone is feeling about these changes? Well, I guess if I'm completely honest, I think that the current junior medical staff probably have limited awareness of the changes. They're undertaking their training in the old system that we're used to and they're not likely to be affected much by the new framework. Similarly, our supervisors probably have some general awareness that there will be changes coming from next year. But as a lot of those changes are still evolving, they uh, probably aren't aware of a lot of the detail at this stage. So it's probably really only those involved in implementing the changes or in medical education units who are well enough informed to have any real emotion about it. And I guess our emotion would be a mixture of excitement and maybe a little bit of anxiety about the degree of change. Great. And, and what's exciting you about the changes? I think there's a number of things that are have the potential to be really fantastic. I think expanding the uh, program to second year junior medical doctors, I think is a huge advantage over the current system. I also think in um, maybe later iterations of the program, expanding to community settings will be an enormous benefit for junior doctors and for the community as a whole. And I think if done well, the expansion of supervisor training and increasing supervisor skills and engagement will be uh, of huge benefit too. Great. So Monique, as Chair of the Medical Students Council of Victoria, again representing over 4,000 medical students, that's a lot, there would have to be some concerns from some of those students. But before we get into what those concerns may be, as a medical student, what would you say are the key benefits of the new framework? Yeah, well, I think the, the benefits really reflect what Jenny's just said. Essentially, this is a proven model. So we're going into this with hoping with a hope to replicate what we see in other countries that have been running for years and years on this program, like the NHS. So we know that it works and it's going to be falling into line and putting us on par with you know other countries across the world. But also it's formal training. So by expanding it into the second year post-graduation, we're seeing a chance to get more training and more supervision for our junior doctors, meaning that we know that we're on par. We know that our supervisors are going to be trained and it gives us the chance to really showcase our skills and ensure that we're being the best doctors that we can be for our patients. And it's also important to notice that there's a new impact, a new focus, sorry, on trainee well-being that they're bringing into the program so that, yes, there's a focus on performing at a certain level. There's also that focus that if there's students that are not performing possibly, that there's always the option to look at that from a well-being perspective, which is really important. And you mentioned the well-being side of things. What I guess I'll, I'll flick to one of the concerns which has been around the extension into two years, but that does provide a bit of leeway and latitude for people to get through their first year, doesn't it? Yes. So, I mean, in terms of well-being, um, obviously this program comes with a bigger workload and there is that two-year program, which can be impactful for people that want to take a year off or that 
may come across issues with their well-being that impacts their performance. But there is a lot of leeway. So for example, with the assessments, if somebody's not performing, it doesn't mean that you, you know, you have to stop and start again, like it might be the case in medical school if you don't pass your exams. They definitely look at it from a well-being perspective and how can we support our junior doctors and make sure that you can get to the end of the year and still reach the level of standards that you need to. And there's also a lot of leeway for things like gap years and taking leaves um, like you might otherwise. So there's definitely a lot of flexibility in the program if you need it. Fantastic. Jenny, I know there's a number of changes and there's probably a number of benefits. What would you say are the some of the key benefits for future interns and HMOs? You've mentioned some already like community terms, but would you like to expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, so I think the our just talking to community terms, the current model really doesn't provide much exposure to community medicine at all for junior doctors. So it's very difficult for them to decide whether that's a career that they're interested in or not in the future. It's an area of need in our community. So it makes perfect sense for our teaching model to include exposure to community terms or junior doctors to have good experiences and uh, perhaps pursue that as a career. I think one of the other advantages is, is I I think you've already touched on the the inclusion of work-based assessments and the expectation of graded improvements in, in performance and graded skill acquisition through the year with a focus on formative assessments and increased assistance for junior doctors so that they acquire those skills rather than having sort of pass Hurdles. What about the second year cohort? Some people have described them as a bit of a lost tribe in medicine. Are there some benefits for them in this these changes, do you think? Absolutely. As I said earlier, I think that's really one of the key advantages to the framework. The pre-vocational doctors, you know, past interns are really our lost tribe. There's not a lot of oversight or advocacy for this group. So by including second year uh, trainees in the framework, we're ensuring that these people who are still junior and very early in their careers still have appropriate supervision, training, educational opportunities while they develop. Monique, would you like to comment on the community term issue? This is a new thing in the new framework, and I imagine the the public would be quite interested to know that the current system doesn't really promote community terms very much, and they would probably be surprised given the the dearth in GP numbers and GP training numbers in Australia. How do you feel about that change? Yeah, well, honestly, as a student, it's not something that we're very familiar with until we get right up until the end of medical school. So for me, me, even as a final year student, it was a surprise to see that it's not really availability during our current program. But I think with the implementation of community terms in the next couple of years, it offers a really fantastic opportunity to get students and junior doctors really excited about things like general practice and even community mental health, as well as some of the more niche areas of medicine, particularly in the rural health side of things. It's a fantastic opportunity also for training because we'd often see a lot more diversity, a lot more exposure to you know the real guts of medicine, whether it be undifferentiated presentations or really looking after your community. So I think it's a fantastic learning opportunity for junior doctors and a fantastic opportunity for our communities to get people into the rural GPs, to get people into the metro GPs, to get people into rural medicine and generalist medicine and general where we really need doctors. Jenny, back to you. Any benefits that you see for the supervisors in the hospitals? Uh, yeah, I think the, the framework provide a lot of increased training for supervisors. It's something that certainly in my generation we were never trained in. It was just assumed that you knew how to do supervision well, which is not necessarily true. So having formal supervisor training and supervisor upskilling, I think, is likely to lead to increased engagement, probably increased job satisfaction, and maybe even uh, retention of staff at health services, which is an issue at the moment. Acknowledging that finding the time to do that within the current system is going to be one of the greatest challenges, I think. Yeah, the, the Australian Medical Council, which is oversighting all of this through the pre-vocational councils, does even on its information acknowledge that this is going to take up additional time and resources. How's a health service like yours thinking through that at this point in time? Yeah, so we're thinking about it a lot. <laughs> and I, as I said, I really think this is going to be the greatest challenge. So our uh, supervisors, or for our supervisors, supervision of junior staff is one of many competing priorities that mm. they have at the service and many of those senior staff are only at the health service for certain fractions of time during the week. So creating the time and the space for them to have appropriate training and to actually fulfil the roles or the requirements of being a good supervisor is something we really have to think about. I guess we already have 
bit of a framework at our health service for that, which we would plan to build on, you know, as the framework rolls out. It's good to see that the framework has recognised something that was a passion of mine some time ago, which is acknowledging the role of registrars, nurses, allied health as supervisors. So I understand under the new framework, for example, a pharmacist can be trained as a supervisor and provide some oversight for an intern. Is that correct? Yes. So there's a capacity for certainly a, a much greater range of people to be involved in supervision. And I think that's really reflective of what happens in normal practice in the hospital. So having the senior doctor or the consultant that does a ward round once a week as the nominated only supervisor that is, isn't really consistent when you really have fellows and registrars and senior nurses and, and others that are far more involved on a day-to-day -day basis with the junior staff. So we've mainly focused so far on the doctors themselves, um, but of course there is a purpose to all this education and training, which is the patients. Would either of you care to comment on how these changes might be of benefit to patients and families, starting with you, Monique? Well, I think a really important thing for the patients to benefit from is the fact that this program brings in a diversity of clinical placement options. We've heard about the introduction of you know, clinical terms potentially in the next couple of years that are going to be in the community, but also that we're seeing more options for things like Indigenous health. We're seeing like mental health placements becoming mandatory for all junior doctors. So it's, it means that for our patients, our junior doctors are actually training in areas that better represent the diversity of our population and that our junior doctors are also going to be more prepared and they're going to be held to a particular standard so we can feel assured that our junior doctors are going to be serving our patients very well. And it's also important to consider that with this new program, there's a shift towards more clinical work rather than the typical administrative tasks for our junior doctors doctors, which means that they're going to be more clinically trained, they're going to be more comfortable in the patient space, which is always fantastic for our patient care. In comment from you, Jenny. Uh, yeah, I really agree with what Monique said. I'd probably just add that our health system is really heavily reliant on junior doctors to do the bulk of the day-to-day -day work. So anything that increases junior doctor capability, satisfaction and welfare is going to be in the patient's best interest. And then I think in the longer term, encouraging junior doctors to explore careers in areas of community need will also be an advantage. Monique, what have been some of the questions or concerns that medical students have raised about the changes? Well, as you can probably imagine, there's been quite a few concerns. I think a part of it is that this is something that's very unfamiliar to us, where a lot of us are coming from our clinical years of medical school, having very little idea of what the actual program looks like now. So the idea of changes can be quite scary. But I suppose the main kind of questions lie in the areas of what the training workload is going to be and what our working conditions are going to be. So I guess number one would be, is this a two year training program as an intern? Is this going to set us back? So I guess I can comment in that interns will still receive their general registration after 12 months or 47 weeks of work. So it's not a delay in obtaining registration. I really think it's not going to set anyone back in terms of training. It's just going to improve the conditions and support for people in their second year working, which is currently an area of weakness, I guess. The next concern, Minnie? The other thing that we often see people getting quite concerned about is the workload and the training environment. Mm -hmm. Clearly at the moment, we've got the five-turn intern year, but with things like shifting towards a generalist year two program and looking at potentially a, creating a four-year term sorry four-term year will that mean that we have less opportunity to you know diversify and explore particular interests for example a lot of people might like to do an entire year in a surgical stream rather than doing this generalist program so what does it mean for the diversity of our training opportunities and our clinical experience Jenny, do you do want to comment on that? Yeah, so in terms of diversity, I guess I'd probably think about the intern year and the second year separately. So you're right, currently we have a five-term year for interns in Victoria and I think in most states in Australia. In the framework, there is possibility to move to a four-term year. That will require an enormous amount of planning and coordination statewide. At this stage, uh, no clear plan to do that, but lots of discussion about the potential for that. And as you've said, there's pros and cons to doing that. An advantage to the five-term model is that interns are able to experience five different rotations. I guess all I can say is there's still a lot of discussion about whether that shifting to a four-term model would be of benefit. In terms of limiting opportunities in the second year, the requirement for exposure to certain types of clinical experiences in second year still exists, but it, I guess it's a little less 
stringent than what it is for interns. And I think depending on the classification of different rotations, which the health services are still working on, I don't see that that will really alter the natural flow of transition to maybe people start, some people start to stream to areas of interest in their second year. I think that will still be possible, although how all of this will be coordinated within some colleges is is one of the things that is still evolving and we're all keen to hear about. It's important to recognise that these changes are happening in the context of a number of other changes around medical training. For example, at the other end of the doctor training spectrum, there's a big change around continuing professional development for specialists at the moment, for example. Many of the the changes have to, well, the framework reflects that this is for the entirety of Australia, every state and territory, and some states and territories are already, uh, you know, have different approaches to to this space. For example, New South Wales has had a two-year contract in place for decades now, and that's actually seen as a benefit from the, the, in, the interns and residents in New South Wales. WA has had a three-year contract for some years. I think ACT Health went to a four-term uh, approach many years ago as well. And my understanding is that the AMC, as Jenny has said, has ruled that in your second year, you have to be in a program, but you could, for example, be doing the BPT program so long as you're doing that program. So you've got an option to either do the this framework or another program under a college. So there is that opportunity to stream a bit earlier in second year if there's a pathway for doing that. I understand, Monique, there are some concerns from students that this might delay entry into specialty training. What have you heard about that? Yeah, certainly a concern that a lot of students at the moment do have. I think it comes from, in part, unfamiliarity with what this new framework means. I think there's a misconception that this is extending the intern year to two years and in general registration and specialty streams in that sense. But I think the other concern was, like I said earlier, that we may not have the opportunity to do that, you know, SRR, SRMO role for an entire year in ONG, for example, which might give a lot of people a leg up into the program. But from my perspective as a student now, it's not something I'm concerned about because I do understand that it's a general registration at the same time and that it's just a more generalist and more supervised version of what we already have. And were there any specific concerns from international medical students that you've come across? To be honest, not particularly. Um, I think if students have studied in Australia, they're familiar with the program and how it will run, you know, from the perspective of that they're here and they, if they can get a job, um, which we know is quite difficult for a lot of international medical students, that they're going to be in the same program that they've been, you know, running with their cohort with through medical school. Um, I think it does bring in like concerns if it means for, you know, graduates from other countries coming into Australia to work, taking gap years to go work overseas and what it means to come back into our training program and if there's the option to streamline that process. But I think that's where the main concerns would lie. Excellent. All right. So Jenny, moving on to the next question. Jenny, the intern framework is moving us from a system where you essentially had to pass all of your terms, including a medicine, a surgery and an emergency term. As you've said already, specific terms will no longer be mandatory. I think you've explained this a little bit already, but could you just explain how the term system is going to work from 2024? Yeah, so it's probably helpful to to talk about what will be the same. And I think the backbone of an intern year and probably a second year will be the same. So talking specifically about interns now, interns will still need to complete satisfactorily 47 weeks of supervised clinical practice. They will need to have experience in a variety of types of medicine. It's the the allocation of that variety and the terms that will be different. So whereas, as you've said, we currently have core medical, core surgical and core emergency rotation and then other rotations that are allocated as non-core within our roster, those core terms will no longer exist and instead interns will need to obtain experience in four nominated clinical experiences. So those would be care of undifferentiated uh, patients with undifferentiated illness, care of patients with acute and critical illness, care of patients with chronic illness, uh, and then periprocedural or perioperative care. In the, the second year part of the framework, second year trainees would need to have experience in three of those clinical experiences, uh, the the perioperative or periprocedural care uh, would not be mandatory in the second year of the framework. They're probably the the key differences. There's some limitations to the amount of time that you can spend in any one specialty or subspecialty. So junior doctor will not be able to work for more than 50% of the year in one specialty 
25% of the year in one subspecialty. Monique, have, have these changes caused any concern for medical students? For example, I know when I was the medical director at Hetty, which is the pre-vocational council equivalent in New South Wales, medical students were always very keen on keeping the emergency term. So any comment on that? Yeah, I think that there is obviously a, a great keenness among the medical students to keep that emergency term because that is where we see a lot of our undifferentiated presentations where you really get to develop that gusto of medicine that a lot of students get really excited about. But with this program, we're still seeing the opportunity to do emergency medicine. And in fact, there's actually more flexibility in the program because you just have those four clinical domains that you need to kind of tick off as you go through the year. And you can still get that undifferentiated presentation and acute care in other specialties as well. And it gives the opportunity to do things like once the community terms came in that we're talking about earlier, that's an opportunity to develop that same experience that students may opt to do if they want to look at something a little bit more chronic care or community care. So I don't think it really changes too much from that perspective. And so Jenny, we've talked about this already in terms of the extra load on the supervisor and the AMC acknowledging there will be a requirement for more assessments to be done and those sort of things. How are you planning for the rollout? As it stands at the moment, we already have a nominated group of term supervisors for our key rotations and those people are provided some time within their work at the hospital to undertake their supervisory role and we also run a supervisor training program. So the first step for us will be to uh, incorporate training for the new framework into the training that we provide for those pre-existing supervisors. PMCB uh, have created a number of working groups and one of the working groups is actually developing supervisor training models that the health services can use so we don't all have to create our own training which is really important because the workload of doing that would be substantial. And over the next couple of years, there's certainly going to be a need to expand our um, trained supervisor population. And I mean, that is exciting in that providing supervisor training to, to some of those other groups that we spoke about before uh, is something that we've been really keen to do, but it, logistically it's been challenging. So I guess it will give us the opportunity to be able to reinforce the need to, to train a, a broader group of supervisors within the hospital. But that, we'll have to do that in a graded fashion, obviously, just uh, to fit in within other requirements of hospital work. Yeah, so the, the PMCV have been listening to the hospitals and the directors of training and providing you with support? Uh, absolutely, yeah. So the uh, PMCV have really taken a lead, I think, in, in helping to helping health services prepare. I think they acknowledge that health services, particularly smaller health services, the, the workload of preparing to implement this is really substantial. And obviously it's logical for a lot of that to be done centrally and shared rather than each health service try and do individually you know, uh, their own versions. So PMCV have created working groups and drawn from their health services and had forums to listen to the concerns of the health services and answer the questions of the health services. They're uh, creating a number of resources for health services to use. So they've got a, an implementation timeline, which is actually really helpful for us to have a look at what we should be doing to be ready on time. And they're currently looking at creating important resources like templates for term descriptions so that we can allocate clinical experiences for each term appropriately and uh, supervisor training resources as well. Great. And Monique, I understand that the PMCV has also been engaging with the medical students via your council about the changes. Has this been helpful? Yeah, I think it's been fantastic really to see the PMCV and, you know, the wider stakeholders getting involved with the medical students, not only in Victoria, but obviously countrywide, purely because we are the next doctors coming into the program and we will be the quote unquote guinea pigs. It's been really fantastic to actually get the input from medical students and ensure that, that the new program actually reflects the needs of junior doctors. And I think it's been great that the council and I'm sure the wider medical student councils across the country have been able to add their part to the discussions, whether it be, you know, technology aspects with things like logbooks that might work for us or ways in which the program could run to benefit not only us, but our patients and the stakeholders as well. So. It's really great to see that collaboration happening. It's 2024. Monique's graduated from medicine and she's turning up for her internship orientation at Monash or perhaps at your hospital at St Vincent's. What might she expect to see that might be different to what currently happens? Yeah, so the different elements of the framework will be rolled out uh, in a staged 
fashion, which I guess there's good and bad to that. So the intern year next year will be part of the new framework. Uh, however, uh, junior doctors in their second year, so this year's current interns will be continuing in the old model. So from 2024, uh, the framework will commence for interns and then the framework will commence for second years in 2025. The master roster of rotations may look slightly different than our current master roster because that'll be rearranged to make sure that junior doctors are having exposure to the appropriate clinical experiences rather than core terms. Although at this stage, it looks like the actual working year for uh, most interns will probably look pretty similar to what they are already doing. E-portfolio will not be ready uh, for 2024. So the EPA assessments, the trustable professional activity assessments that will be part of the framework, as I understand at this stage, will be something that health services can choose to do but won't be mandated. So successful completion of a term will actually still be based on mid and end of term assessments as we currently do. So the year will probably not look or feel greatly different to what we're currently doing, but there will be a gradual transition to the changes for the new framework. All right. Thanks again for Dr. Jenny Newnham and Monique Wisniewski for joining me today. And thank you also to the Postgraduate Medical Council of Victoria for organising the interviewees to have a chat to me today. I guess I look forward to hearing back from both of you about how the changes are going towards throughout the year and, and perhaps even touching base on another interview in early 2024 to find out the status of the changes. So thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, guys.